Hello and welcome back to my Dallas Cowboys blog. It's been a little while because there was so much craziness that happened in the NFL. Um, the Cowboys hired Scott Linehan to call the plays. They addressed what the defensive coordinator position will look like next year. And the Super Bowl happened. And the Super Bowl was pretty monumental, I would have to say. And it really changes the perception of how you build your team towards youth, how successful you're expected to be in the draft, and uh, how much you know a head coach with an innovative vision for his team can achieve it if he has the backing and the full, the full enthusiastic backing of the general manager. Um, I'm adjusting my screen fonts so everything's bigger. So I do want to pick up where I left off the Dallas Cowboy player templates from the 2013 draft using combine data. Uh, but first off, let's start with all the, ch all the changes and transitions that have happened. So it seems like there are three head coaches, or there's three coaches for five positions. But if we kind of, uh, I mean, I think that we can say that the media in Dallas has a pretty good grasp on the situation. It seems like they're all reinforcing each other. Maybe they're just reinforcing one person's opinion over and over again, which sometimes happens in media circles. But I think by and large we can actually believe them when they say that this is Jason Garrett's decisions and these are Jason Garrett's coaches. And we're going to give Jason Garrett a chance to fail on his own terms. Now, we have no idea if Jason Garrett was actually behind the removal of the 3-4 defense in Dallas and yeah, going back to the 4-3. I am a fan of the 4-3 because it looks a lot like the Dallas Cowboys history. I know that teams change and strategies transition, but it always seemed a little bit like someone else's defense in Dallas. And a lot of great memories in the institution were based around having an eight-man defensive line um, and the ability to comfortably drop seven players into pass coverage while you rush only four. Uh, that's something Phil, or something Seattle did with, you know, with ease in the Super Bowl. Watching the Super Bowl, the safeties for Seattle were amazing, and I can't knock wanting to draft a safety in the first round, but it was, Peyton Manning was able to complete passes down the field whenever he could stand in the pocket. He didn't have any opportunities to stand in the pocket. He was moving around a lot and I think that was the pass rush. You have to say that Seattle's pass rush is really what disrupted Peyton Manning. Even Troy Aikman during the game was trying to kind of quiet the awesomeness of Seattle's secondary. It's not like they were invulnerable. But as long as the pass rush made Peyton Manning get rid of the ball so fast, he, uh, the secondary in Seattle couldn't give up the big plays that they actually left themselves vulnerable to. They were playing very aggressively. There were a couple of different routes that could have burned them, but they would have taken much too long to develop. So, I mean, maybe if Peyton Manning had a much better offensive line, or at least a better offensive line on the right side, they would have had a better chance. But instead, Seattle had lots of depth on defense. They just kept sending wave and wave of pass rusher. They were only four pass rushers, but they had a bunch of guys on the defensive line that they could send out there with confidence. Um, guys like Cliff Averill and Martellus Bennett, not Martellus Bennett, Michael Bennett, who used to play at Texas A&M also, but those two players are like rotational players for them, uh, and they're both good in their own to get like eight sacks, you know, a year on their own. Um, they don't have to be paired with an awesome defensive end on the other side for them to get eight sacks. So that's a lot of players in the arsenal for the for the Seattle Seahawks on their defensive line, and I still think that's really, I mean, it's pretty when you consider all the players Dallas lost on defensive line over the course of the year and from transitioning to a 3-4 to a 4-3 and because the players bodies had to change they had to gain muscle weight they had to learn new techniques it's not surprising we had so many injuries and our pass rush was abysmal and our secondary got burned it probably felt pretty embarrassing to play defensive back for Dallas this year and a lot of the defensive backs could have done something miraculous and helped us out a little more but without the pass rush, we're really just leaving those guys out to dry. They can't advance in their careers until the front four get fixed. And really, it's, it's the front four that we need to fix. It's not even the front seven. I think somehow between Bruce Carter, uh, Sean Lee, uh, Devontae Holloman, 
and Kyle Wilbur that will actually have four good starting linebackers for three positions. Plus, we'll have some backups that we'll get from free agency or maybe they're already on the roster. Um, but then our front four was just abysmal. Now, we'll get some guys back from injury. We'll have guys like Everett Brown that are maybe worth keeping and developing a little bit. But Everett Brown sounds like, to me, he should be like the seventh defensive lineman on the roster. Um, unless he can emerge as a dynam dynamic playmaker, I don't think, you know, what role would a guy like that play on the Seahawks? I think there is a role for a guy like Everett Brown um, because he has athletic measurables that are really strong. And at the very least, he'll command some attention um, even when a guy like DeMarcus Ware is playing really well and DeMarcus Ware is co commanding all the attention. Even just having an athletic dude on the other side take advantage of a one-on-one -on -one matchup can be effective. Uh, do I, so I do think Dallas... It is really cloudy and really bizarre and really draconian the way they arrived at their new formula for the head coaching hierarchy with a play caller, but Bill Callahan still the offensive coordinator. And, you know, looking back at it, it's just so bizarre that Bill Callahan and Jason Garrett are even part of the same staff considering how different Bill Callahan's offensive history is. Bill Callahan came from the West Coast offense. He came from Oakland. He was coaching under John Gruden. John Gruden's offense, maybe you remember it a little bit if you're around my age or older, um, it featured teams lining up in pretty conventional formations, but then with about five seconds on the play clock, players would begin motioning as much as they could. John Gruden's teams would sometimes get penalized for illegal motion and procedural penalties like that because he was always trying to line up players in funky positions you know he was probably the first guy I saw take a wide receiver and line him up at, at the running back and then have him run a fly route uh, and he would do this because the defenses of the time were really dedicated to their zones and they were assigning their man matchups based on where offensive players lined up on the field so John Gruden could take a star wide receiver, line him up at running back, and then suddenly the defense is in a terrible scheme because they have their middle linebacker lined up on the running back. And the defense isn't able to communicate, so the cornerback doesn't come over to help the running back um, or to help the wide receiver now. And the linebacker is out of position. And so you can see how the John Gruden deep offense um, was pretty meticulous. It also, some of the other features of the Gruden offense, especially when Bill Callahan called the plays ultimately as he took over Oakland, they had a lot of short passes. They had a lot of dink and dunks. Rich Gannon was the NFL MVP. He probably had a pretty short yards per pass attempt, um, but he threw it to guys that could really catch the ball and could stretch the field once they caught it. I mean, it's basically what you think of when you think of a West Coast offense. You catch a slant, and you make big yardage after the catch. Um, and then they had three running backs, and they would run a zone scheme. The running backs were all very different, guys like Charlie Garner, who was the fast guy, and then they had the power guy. They had like 2,400 yards rushing. Anyway, that offense is different from the Jason Garrett, Air Coryell kind of offense. Um, when you think of Jason Garrett's offense, you should think of deep passes and short runs. And I don't mean short runs, I mean power runs. Uh, a lot of the stuff we used to think about with Nort Turner. Um, obviously, every NFL offense borrows a lot from every other NFL offense, and things have continued to evolve. But I always thought Bill Callahan and Jason Garrett was a pretty strange marriage. Um, I think Scott Linehan makes a lot more sense. I was pretty excited with how our offensive line had developed, and I just I don't want to see the positive motions forward getting lost because we keep transitioning coaches, changing out schemes. Now the players are now having to grow in a different direction. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, and so coming out of that Super Bowl, I want to get back to the defensive ends because I was about to write you know, uh, an analysis of the defensive end class of 2013. And having watched that Super Bowl, just reiterated how important these players are. Well, Dallas was last in 2013 in defense, and Dallas was first. So there's 30 teams between Dallas and Seattle. So that's how much ground we have to cover. Um, you know, and you have to wonder, are the cheap quarterback contracts that Seattle, San Francisco, and Indianapolis have, they enable those franchises to go out and sign other free agents. Uh, and that helps bolster their team's depth. But at the same time, 
Dallas Cowboys paid $14 million for Anthony Spencer. And for that price, they could have also they could have had Cliff Averill and Michael Bennett for the same cost as Anthony Spencer. Anthony Spencer's a great player, though. Uh, I'm just saying, probably not $14 million worth. And maybe getting more mid-range free agents rather than trying to develop stars uh, would have helped Dallas more. Especially transitioning defensive lines. I mean, we were changing schemes. We definitely could have stood to bring in more linemen. Uh, okay, so here you go. It was shown that in 2013, Dallas Cowboys draft board was leaked at least rounds one through five. Was it really leaked? Considering Dallas skipped Sheriff Floyd, I can imagine that the board was updated in the time between the photos and the actual draft. If the photo is from day of the draft, well, then what the hell can I say? Dallas shouldn't aspire to be Machiavellian in his decision making, conniving the draft board and skipping top five players. But whatever, let's get to the defensive ends. Most Dallas fans want to see some defensive ends drafted, like two minimum. It's definitely a position of interest. Based on what I've seen looking over the combine data, I predict that Dallas projects players like Tyrone Crawford as a three-tech and Ben Bass currently as a one. Accepting the unlikely return of Anthony Spencer, Dallas currently has under contract what it ended the season with. Selvy Ware and Everett Brown. For all the players involved in a rotation, a rotation would be best. Ware is aging. Selvy and Brown, in my view, are not going to be all pros. And... Um, they're not going to be good enough to just be on the field 80 plays a game. So we need them to rotate um, in order for them to be effective. For us to get what we need out of Selby and Brown, we need them to also rotate. Uh, the leaked draft board that I'm citing, here's a leak to it, is uh, you can see it in the description of my YouTube comments, also in the blog post. Okay. Because the defensive end position is such a position of interest, I thought I'd start there. I'm going to set the ground floor by finding the lowest performer in every combine score and project that as the lowest possible score needed to be a defensive end in Dallas. These players were on the Dallas board at defensive end in 2013. Deion Jordan, Ezekiel Ansah, Jorn Werner, Marcus Hunt, Datone Jones, Demontre Moore, Corey Lemonier, LeVar Edwards, Mike Buchanan, Connie Washington, Alex Okafor, Malika Goodman, Jamie Collins, Tank Carradine, Brandon Jenkins. It just reminds me of seeing Demontre Moore here. You remember how the New York Giants have won two Super Bowls behind Monster Pass Rush? Um, I hope that it's obvious to the Dallas Cowboys franchise how much our pass rush is suffering. Um, and we need to get that off the ground before we can compete again. All right, so the last three were not at the combine that the Cowboys had listed. Um, on their draft board, so I'm going to toss out their numbers since I'm using this spreadsheet. The numbers I'm looking at are height, weight, 40 times, lifts, vertical jump, broad jump, 20-yard short shuttle, and the three cone. The two shortest players are 75 inches. The lightest player is 248 pounds. The Montre Moore's terrible combine still haunts him. He has the lowest 40 at 4.95 seconds. He only had 12 lifts. The next closest player on Dallas's board had 20 lifts. 31-inch vertical leap is the lowest on Werner. Broad jump is 111 inches on Werner. 4.51 is the high at strong at the short shuttle. Two players hunt in Edwards. And note that no player ran a short shuttle better than 4.26. 7.32 is the low at three cone. Knowing some offhand things that I know, it's extremely rare for elite edge pass rushers to emerge that don't have elite short shuttle times, sub 4.2, or at least elite power numbers like a 39 inch vertical a 10 foot 5 inch broad jump and 30 lifts. This edge pass rushing class actually projects as a collection of backups from my own anecdotal experience following the draft. I don't predict these players to be terribly successful. Um, you certainly won't have anyone getting 80 sacks in 5 years from this group. So these are the numbers, the athletic floor of defensive ends on Dallas's board. 75, 248, 4.95, 12, 31, 111, 4.51, and 7.32 seconds. I'm tempted to throw out Demontre Moore's 12 lifts and 4.95 time in the 40 since his numbers are so different from everyone else. And there's a well-known infatuation with players from Texas by the Dallas Cowboys, such as Wayne McGarity, that win, uh, Jerry's love of big 12 players like Des Bryant. But since I'm being clinical in getting these numbers, I will remain loyal to the numbers I have. Okay, let's look at the draft board and what players at the combine best of those scores that were not on Dallas's draft board. All of them, <laughs> especially thanks to low performers like Werner and Moore, every other defensive end was able to be competitive with them. 
It's like there was no correlation between your combine numbers and being on the board. If you were at the combine and listed as a defensive end, there was a 50% chance you were on the Cowboys board. So any correlation between what the scouts see and what the num numbers told us is completely spurious at this position right here. At least using this approach of eliminating players with red flags due to athletic combine measurements. Um, clearly, if Demontre Moore did not raise a red flag, then <laughs> athletic markers don't raise red flags at defensive end. Apparently. Uh, okay, left with this knowledge, next time I'm going to gather data based on the player's college productivity and games they played and see if those numbers will tell us a tale of who made Dallas' draft board. Demontre Moore had an awesome junior year in Aggieland. I have a hypothesis that goes something like, defensive end athletic measurables on the number one guide to projecting success, but college production can overcome problems in Dallas's view. If a guy hurts, hits a certain athletic or a certain threshold of sacks and tackles and game starts at a major program, he won't be removed from the draft board. Otherwise, the normal template applies and the search for size speed guys continues. Well, uh, till next time. Right? Well, that was the plan before the Super Bowl. I actually thought Denver would win that Super Bowl. <laughs> and now we know what we need to do to catch up with the leaders in the NFL. We need a vastly better defense. Dallas was there against Denver. I don't think Dallas would have stood a chance playing against Seattle. Uh, so um, some ways that Dallas could hang with Seattle that maybe Denver couldn't. I think Dallas has a better offensive line. That pass rush would not have crushed Romo as quickly. <laughs> it might have gotten there eventually, but I do think Dallas' offensive line is better and the Dallas running attack was a little more solid down the stretch. Um, so this search for defensive ends, I start wondering, you know, you're not looking for... Um, it's not very obvious that what you're looking for can be measured um, in the combines very clearly. It might be possible that there's actually a correlation. Maybe it's like it's the speed times the broad jump or some ratio that the coaches are using that I don't know. Uh, and it's unlikely that I'll ever deduce those formulas because I'm not really going to spend my time doing that. What I, I do observe is that it, it really does seem to be an, a qualitative view that the scouts do. That the scouts like some qualitative analysis of the players and they do that in preference to some computer measurable. like. Demontre Moore has to be the biggest example. If he's not eliminated from the Dallas draft board, then clearly doing terrible at the combine doesn't seem to mean very much to the Dallas personnel department. And I guess the question is, is Demontre Moore going to go on to have a good NFL career? I think Demontre Moore is a lot like Everett Brown. And they were kind of drafted similar places. I think that um, well, Everett Brown's faster than Demontre Moore, but I think they'll have similar careers. They're players that present a handful of matchup problems, but they themselves have matchup problems that are exploitable. Everett Brown's not very large, and Demontre Moore is not very fast. So Everett Brown can get pushed down. Demontre Moore can be outran. Uh, but these guys, in limited doses, in a good scheme that is compensating for their weaknesses can be really effective. I don't think they can be really effective every down players. That would be the purview of great players like DeMarcus Ware. But I think they can be good in small doses. And so, I mean, so these guys, they need rotations. We're talking about second round players. Uh, we're talking about second round players drafted due to qualitative evidence that is not quantified very readily by their athletic measurables. Um, anyway, so this was a long post. We had a lot to cover. I had a lot to cover and, and wanted to get off my mind. Uh, the one thing that I can, I want to wrap up this blog post with is, is just that thought that it really is up to our scouts' point of view. Whether our scouts are right or wrong about players, uh, we really are leaving a lot to their opinion, and we don't seem to be leaving it a lot to some ratio. It's not like there is a... Um, well, at least it's becoming more difficult to see a uh, quantified way to measure a scout's meaningful success, is what I would say. Um, and with that, I guess that, you know, leaves you just with the feeling, are you optimistic that this Will Clay fellow is going to put together a board 
based on opinion uh, effectively is it going to work and the question you know because we no longer have some clean science or you know a measuring ruler by which to make a board and to compare players across different positions so much more than I ever probably became you know much more than I ever realized before I started looking at the combine data that this effort of scouting really is the work of a bunch of people's opinions and it really is not the work of um, measurements and scientific data they want to add scientific data but as it stands it comes down to you know a great defensive end coach or a great you know someone that knows a defensive end when he sees one and a coach that knows how to coax out of that player their great defensive endness most people agree that what makes a great defensive end is their ability to change direction while keeping their their speed um, there's a lot of positions at football that are made better by being able to change direction at speed but defensive end is one of the most important ones um, and it's funny there's a lot of different ways to change direction you can do it because you're running and you're dipping your shoulders or maybe um, uh, well there's a lot of different ways so I guess you know it comes down to how much you actually trust the guys that are making these decisions and I didn't realize it really does come down to like the head coaches uh, not just the head coaches but the assistant coaches on your staff and their tastes and pleasures. I mean, it's so arbitrary and comical. Um, one of the things that also impressed me about the Seahawks, I mean, these guys, they built a team successfully by having successful drafts deep into the draft. And again, that's like a general manager's intuition that these players can contribute in the NFL and then a coach that can go out and coax that from them. Um, anyway, this has been a long rambling blog post but we had a Super Bowl we had uh, we had to see how that would impact the future of the NFL and I think what it tells you is that defense clearly wins championships that over the Seahawks look poised to have a dynasty and if you're gonna build a dynasty you build it with a defense uh, it just reminded of us that us of that almost all the best teams of late and the best teams of yore always had great defenses. As a Cowboys fan, we had grown used to having a great offense and just hoping that the defense comes together for a year or two. Um, clearly, that's just not going to work. Dallas needs a great defense, too. I am sick of watching bad defense. Sick of watching bad defense in the 3-4. Sick of watching it in the 4-3. It comes down to individual players winning one-on-one -on -one matchups over and over again. And Dallas needs to get back to that. That's all there is to it. We need coaches that can find players, that can win one-on-one -on -one matchups, and we need coaches that will not put those players in a position where they're easily exploited. That's what it comes down to. Um, hopefully, I mean, actually, you know, we think guys like Rod Marinelli can coach. We think players like Jason Garrett can coach. Well, um, I'm looking forward to it. I think they can do it. They, uh, everyone seems to have their back against the wall. So I think in Dallas, they realize they have to win now or they're gonna be fired next year. So the win now means I think you have to get into the playoffs. Seattle's won games in the playoffs even before they won the Super Bowl. Uh, and I mean won games like last year. Dallas is, is a long way removed from that. And it is because of our terrible pass rush. Oh well. I am hoping the Cowboys franchise is well on the way to reestablishing the pass rush. We do have some parts we can work with, but we need we need a few more. We need we need more guys that can produce eight sacks a year, and then we need to rotate them. Right now, we have two guys that can produce that many sacks. I think Selvi and Ware can produce that many sacks. If we had four guys that could maybe compete for eight sacks in a year from defensive end alone, if maybe the worst guy at your defensive end spot could start and get eight sacks in a year then that would be really strong. And that's what Seattle has. They have Cliff Averill, and they have Michael Bennett, and they have Cullen Clemens. Those are three really good defensive ends. They're not three all-star defensive ends. They're just three really good defensive ends. And used in a rotation effectively, they can keep pressure from the right and the left. Anyway, that's what Dallas doesn't have. That's what our defense is worst at. And that's uh, going to wrap up this blog post. It was long. I uh, hope you enjoyed it.